Uh, feel free to make yourself more comfortable next door and in here. If you need to move around somewhere to get a better seat, that's cool. You're most welcome to it. Thank you, Malcolm. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Andrew and I've been on holiday for six weeks. Woohoo! Um, I sometimes get to preach at the front, uh, less and less because there's such a great team of preachers here, but I try and get as much as I can. We're heading into the book of Mark, we're going to be hitting Mark chapter 9 today. And if you've got a Bible, grab one out of the row in front of you, grab it on your cell phone. If you're next door, I think Graham's handing Bibles out there on the piano there, there's only a few there. There's more on the dock back shelf in here if someone wants to run through and grab some. Mark chapter 9. Uh, the dog ate my, ate my homework last night, and so there is no PowerPoint. Um, the dog broke into our house and built into my computer and destroyed our PowerPoint. No, not really. <laughs> so what we're going to do today is we're going to do a few repetitions. We're going to go backwards and forwards and try and remember a few things together. I want to ask you, and every Sunday I go to myself that I'm on, I've got to do a PowerPoint, I've got to do a PowerPoint this week, and then it runs late and it, and it, and it, yeah, it um, gets really hairy and stuff, and you go, well, do you want a PowerPoint or do you want a message? So I work on the message instead of the PowerPoint, but I actually want to be better at different PowerPoints. I wonder if you want to be better at different things. Maybe not doing PowerPoints, but if you want to be better, ask yourself that question. Is there anything that I would like to be better at? Would you like to be a better person, a better parent, a better teacher, a better driver? There's lots of people I would like to be a better driver. Would you like to be a better workmate, a better wife, a better husband, a better friend, a better musician, a better ornithologist, a better runner, a better student? Would you like to be a better child to your parents? Would you like to be a better church member? Yeah, we've got a huge mix of people uh, in this whole building. Uh, I wonder if we've got that one thing in common that we want to be better. Jesus had an incredibly eclectic mix of followers. His followers were from all different works of, walks of life. They were odd in some ways, not a whole lot in common, but they had one thing in common, and that is that they wanted to be better. They wanted to be better, they wanted to do better, and they wanted to get better. And that was actually a huge motivation for them to follow Jesus. Initially, they wanted to become better people, or that might not be the correct way of saying it, but in many ways, they followed Jesus because they wanted to be better. So they asked him questions, they followed him around, they observed him, they wanted to be better. One time, as they were hanging out, they were actually walking, and Jesus was somehow in front of them, and just out of gear shot, he couldn't quite hear what they were discussing. I wonder if they were just hanging back to have a certain conversation. What was their certain conversation? You'd see it in Mark chapter 9 and Mark chapter 10, all around the 35 mark. Their conversation was around this. Who is the greatest of all of them? Out of these 12 followers that Jesus handpicked to follow them, who was the, who was the greatest? And so that was their discussion. Well, hey, I think I'm the greatest. Well, no, I think I'm the greatest. And this is why I'm the greatest. Who was the greatest? Mark chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus caught wind of this and gave them clear grammatical instructions on how to be great. And you'll see that in Mark chapter 9, verse 35. Instructions on how to be great. Sitting down, Mark chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Anyone who wants to be first must be very last and serve the all. I used to do some local swimming lake races on the lake, one kilometre in the lake uh, on Friday afternoons. It was a fun adventure with a neat bunch of ladies and guys. And my position in the race was off service because I came last just about every single week. I was terrible at it, terrible. But Jesus said, if you want to be first, be last. I think it's so counter to our natural what we're doing. If we were to have a shared lunch as we do sometimes this afternoon, first to the table is who? The kids. They're born with this natural tendency just to get in, get yourself sorted, get the food before it all runs out. And uh, it, it's 
it's counter natural for us to say, no, actually, my plan is to be last. Not just to the table, because we can do that if we're going to be kind, but last to everything. Last in everything. That's my goal. What does it mean to be last? I actually like his second half of what he says there. It clarifies things for me, at least, and hopefully for you. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last, and the servant. A servant, not of who? A servant of every single person, a servant of all. Our question today is if we want to be better, if we want to do great, what do we have to do? Become last or a servant to other people. Not just the ones we choose, but every person. I've been asking myself this question during this week as I've prepared. As I meet with this person, how can I serve them in what I take away? How can I help them? How can I look after them? How can I care for them? How can I look after that person? But the question that I think is a really legitimate question, gee, there's lots of questions today, so that is, is this just for Jesus' closest followers? Is this just for these 12 guys? Because there are some statements that Jesus made that were just for them? Or is this for a whole lot of other people as well? Is this for everyone? So as I was reading my Bible last night, nothing to do with the message rule. I was just having a read through. And I came across two different verses um, straight away. And I wasn't even asking this question at the time, but I highlighted them because I thought, wow, they sound really similar to what Jesus said. The first one is 1 Corinthians 10 verse 24. And I've got a printed here, so I'm going to read it. 1 Corinthians 10 24. No one should seek his own good, but the good of others. No one should seek his own good, but the good of others. That would indicate to me that we're all to look after other people above our own good. What a high standard. Romans 12 verse 10, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself or yourselves. Romans 12 10, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. One more, which I did look up, James 4 verse 6. This is a quote from the Old Testament. Peter uses it, James uses it. It's negative and positive, but it's a powerful statement. God opposes the proud, but shows favour or gives grace to the humble. God is actively against the proud, but he's given grace and favour to those humble. So what does it mean to serve others? This is where your role comes in. We're going to start learning things together. What does it mean to serve others? Number one, it means to look to serve everyone. Can you say that back to me? Look to serve everyone. You ready? We look to serve everyone. Okay, that's an okay start. I see that you're all trying to come last in your vocal volume there, and you've done pretty well. We're going to try it again as we go through. But the first one is to look to serve everyone. Yesterday morning I went for a jog along the lakefront to go to the park run race. I did note that most of our church people that regularly attended were absent and um, shame. But anyway, I was running along. And as I was running along, I saw this guy in front of me in this red shirt. He looked reasonably fast, but I was catching up to him. The reason why I was catching up to him is because he kept stopping on the side of the lakefront. And as I got closer, I could see what he was doing. He was stopping every time he picked up that saw a piece of rubbish on the ground. He'd pick it up and pick it up and pick it up. He's doing a 16k run and he said he does that every morning. Every morning he goes out and he just picks up rubbish on his late front run and back again. So right off the, the lines were. He was doing it for other people so that they can enjoy the beauty. Um, I think it's just an incredible picture of, of sacrifice. I know there's a whole lot of, of people that do that around our town anyway. They call themselves Tidy Topo. And they just go around picking up rubbish all the time. It's incredible what the rest of our nation does, our kings do. But to look to serve everyone means that our idea of being great must be turned up the other way. It's, instead of spending all of our time looking after our own needs, we need to spend massive time looking after others' needs. What does that look like? Well, I think we look at our example of Jesus. I looked up the guest list of Hooker Falls Lodge during the week of all the people who have stayed there. Do you know some of the people who have stayed there? Does anyone know any names? Yeah. Queen Elizabeth, I think, was mumbled in this room. Okay. 
It's a big list, I won't read them all, but it's Queen Beatrice of the Netherlands, Prince William Alexander, Crown Prince of the Netherlands, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, as you said, Duke of Edinburgh, uh, you would hope you could come with her, Prince Edward, uh, Catherine, the Duchess of Kent, uh, Prince William of Luxembourg, Princess Sibylla of Luxembourg, King Albert of Belgium. Oh, it's all just jumped off my list. Massive amounts of kings and royalty have stayed in our the lodge. We never see them because they fly in on their helicopter. When Jesus came, where did he stay? Not at Hooker Lodge. Didn't come to New Zealand, just in case you were wondering. But he didn't stay at Hooker Lodge, he stayed in humble places. He slept down in the fields and the paddocks and his mate's mum's place, Crashmont Dukeyach, long before. If anyone should have been waited on and worshipped upon, it should have been Jesus. But he didn't, he came to serve. He came to serve to the point of exhaustion. You know, Jesus should have come in many ways if it was a natural progression to have lived the good life. To stay in the best places, eat the best food and receive the best service. So I've got three little prayers. These are the things, forget the outline. These are the things I want you to remember. There's three little prayers. When you wake up in the morning or when you sit in your thinking place, when you have a spare moment, ask these three little prayers. Father, who can I serve today? Father, how can I serve today? And Father, where can I serve today? You know, the three prayers of prayers are very similar. I want us to say them together. Who, how, where? Father, who can I serve today? Father, how can I serve today? And Father, where can I serve today? Those three prayers are just incredible. They'll change your outlook on life. And that is the way to be better. By serving, by serving, by serving. I want to give you two little tips along with those three little prayers. That's all you have to remember, those three little prayers today, but here's two tips. Number one, if you want to serve, then listen. Just listen. That alone is a massive form of service. I quite often meet with people and uh, I don't have a lot to say. And so I just sit there kind of listening Thinking, oh, far I wish I was a better pastor, I wish I knew what to say, I wish I knew how to step in to help. And you end up leaving thinking, oh, that was terrible of me. And they say, thank you so much for listening, it was just what I needed. Listening is a huge service, but it will also give you insight into how you can serve others too. As you listen, you go, oh, I hear your needs, I hear your grief, I hear your pain, and now I know where I can serve you. Listen to people, that's first. Second is, just encourage. Have you ever met somebody who doesn't light up the word of encouragement? Have you? I don't know anyone. Everyone lights up with a word of encouragement. Give it a shot. Two little tips. Listen to people and encourage others. Jesus gave a great example of serving, and it's actually my second point. The first one is look to serve everyone. The second one is look to show kindness. When these disciples were arguing about who was the greatest, Jesus didn't slam them, saying, you idiots, you've got it all wrong. He sat down and gently taught them. A few, um, well, one chapter later, in chapter 10 and verse 35, Jesus goes again in the same thing. Have a read through, it's the story. Mark chapter 10 and verse 35, the same thing. Look at Jesus' response in this as much as anything though. Then Jesus, uh, sorry, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever you ask. Man, can I pause there for a moment and just get totally sidetracked? I've been so challenged lately by that request of Jesus. We want you to do for us whatever you ask. I've been so challenged in my own life by relating to God based on how he treats me back. I laugh a little bit or smirk inside myself when friends on Facebook say, hey, I'm out with God because he won't do this. Or my friends talk to me or people I know talk to me, I've, I've given up on God because he won't do this. But you know, as soon as things don't go my way, I'm finding myself saying, God, is it really worth following you? 
you won't do what I really, really want with all my heart. These guys are saying, hey, Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. So this question is just for me. Is my relationship with Jesus Christ, with the Father, with the Spirit, solely based on what He does for me? On the basis of what I desperately want? Or is it based on His character and my desperate need for Him? And Jesus responded gently, what do you want me to do for you? And they replied, well, let us, in your kingdom, because we can see that you're going to be king of this world pretty soon, this is what they're thinking, let one of us sit on your right and the other on your left, you know, so you're in your palace and the servants are coming to serve you. They'll bring us the plates and, and we'll look important, we'll be important, we'll help make decisions. We think we're the best people for the job. Can, can you do that? Jesus said in verse 38, you don't know what you're asking. Can you actually go through the suffering that I'm going to go through? Can you drink the cup or be baptized with the baptism I will be with? Uh, that, that I'm baptized with? And they said, yes, we can. Actually, they couldn't. They disappeared and ran away when Jesus came and got arrested. But later on, the encouraging thing was, is, is actually they did. They did suffer incredibly. James was the first person killed. And John watched all his fellow disciples get killed and was um, um, put into exile. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup that I am to be baptized with and the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, the other ten, they became indignant. Oh, James, how could you? John? And, and so they're angry with these guys, probably because they're asking to be the greatest before them. But Jesus, this is the response I'm looking for. Jesus called them together and said, verse 42, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentile lord it over them. And their high officials exercise over authority over them. In, in our society around us, Jesus is saying that the rulers try and climb the pyramid to the top and then they use their weight to, to squash everyone down and get people running out and doing all sorts of things. But Jesus is saying, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to become first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for me. Okay, there's lots of words there. We're going to come to the second part. But first of all, show kindness. Jesus showed kindness. They were outrageous requests from James and John. Sit on your right and sit on your left. Who do they think they are? But Jesus responded to inappropriate behavior with gentleness. Responding to people that are behaving inappropriate takes incredible gentleness and wisdom, doesn't it? How do I treat this person so that it doesn't keep continuing, so that they learn, but so that it's gracious? Jesus responded gently, but in a learning way. So we've had three little prayers. What were there? Who can I serve today? How can I serve today? Can't I? And where can I serve today? Two little tips. Listen to people. Encourage lots. One little question that you've got to ask yourself. It's a how question again. How can I respond kindly to this person? How can I respond kindly? We need to show kindness like Jesus did. Okay, this is great theory, but it's still not going to make us better. Part way better, not the great way better. The final one is prepared to hurt. Or prepared to hurt. Jesus talks about becoming a slave and a servant. Whoever wants to become great must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. He also said, hey, if you guys want to sit on my right and my left, are you prepared to go through the suffering I'm about to go through? And then he said, in verse 45, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for men. That's not in life, that's in death primarily he's talking to you about. It's instance, interesting that both of these instances come straight after his death. He's saying, I'm about to die. And he slowly, as he tells them he's about to die, he tells them a little bit more details. He tells them by who and he tells them where. But Jesus, to be a great servant, had to suffer and die. It hurts to be gentle, but not to be treated, treated gently in return. I don't know about you, but I've noticed a shift in society today. I've noticed a shift that, that many people say, hey, how can I volunteer? 
Is it just me as I'm getting older? Is it that the way society's going? More and more people are saying, hey, can I volunteer in this? Can I do this? Can I help in this? Uh, all around the community, there's so many volunteers in our town. It's incredible, incredible town to be a part of. How can I volunteer? How can I do my part? But I find it's accompanied by this when you look at it. This kind of thought. I'll help out as long as it doesn't cost too much. As long as it doesn't hurt too much or stretch me out of my comfort zone. Jesus said to be great, you need to suffer, to hurt, to give more. I don't know when you give to others if you've ever given someone more than what you've got. Or do you give someone because you've got someone something, you give them a little less of that. Our bass player this morning, her mother once gave uh, some people her car. It was their family car. It was their only car and they didn't have any means to buy another car. But she gave it away. That's what giving to a hurting level is. Mark 8.35 Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Man, if we're, if we're Christians, if we're followers of Jesus Christ, if you're not, then you're just on a free reign. Do what you want. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ, you're here to suffer. You're here to hurt. Not words we normally talk about in church, eh? One of the areas in church that's dear to my heart, especially at the moment, that needs some help and some people that are willing to sacrifice and give them themselves as our kids under construction program. That's our children's programs. Not a lot of people sit in this room and the next door room at the same time. Thank you guys for the, and, and ladies and children for sitting next door today. This room's packed, that room's packed. I think there was three chairs spare in that room, there was a few chairs spare in this room. Uh, amongst it is a massive amount of kids. Do you know how many children's classes we've got running today? We've got three children's run classes running today. So for all the children in this room, they've only got three, three teachers, and it's not enough. Last week, the average size of the classes were uh, 15 per class. The age range is massive. In, in one class, you've got two-year-olds up to six-year-olds. Can you imagine teaching 15 of them across that age and ability level? Uh, 10 to 13 is the other range range, which is too large. The difference between a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old is massive. And so the rest, if we do the math, is... Did I say 2 to... It's 2 to 6, which is huge. And 7 through to 9. It's, it's too big. And so what we want to do starting next week is start one more class. One of our teachers asked a few people last week, and I don't know who they asked, but no idea if they would be a teacher in the class because he wants to retire. He goes home and has a nap every Sunday after he teaches. Mind you, he's not the only one. <laughs> you get my drift. Uh, and so he asked a few people and they said, you know what? I teach all week. I don't know whether it's homeschool or in the classroom because there's a lot of both in our church. I don't want to come to Sunday and I can't remember the other excuse, but it was really similar. I, I can't make the sacrifice, and, and not everyone can be teachers, not everyone's going to be a teacher. But to look after our classes, we just have three teachers teaching three to four weeks a term. That's, that's all that's required of, of a kids under construction teacher. Three teachers teaching three and a half weeks per term. We've got a couple already looking for it, so we're looking for two new teachers. Um, starting off soon. So we're going to start next week and pray that we've got it because these kids need people who are prepared to sacrifice for them so that they can grow up in an incredible relationship with Jesus Christ. Back to our message. What were our th three things really quickly? Look to serve everyone. Look to show kindness. Prepare to do it. Jesus suffered for all, including you. Have you thought about that? 
He lived to serve you. And what does he do now? He's been exalted to glory. What does he do now? He still serves you. He's interceding right now on your behalf to the Father. He's sitting there saying, look at that person. I know what they've done, but my blood has covered them. I've forgiven them. Or you're forgiven them, sorry, Father, because of what I have done. Listen to what that person's saying. I don't know how it works. That's just my imagination. But he's interceding on our behalf. Jesus still works for us. The Holy Spirit still works in us and for us. The Father still cares for us and supplies all of our needs. Why would you want to live estranged from God? Why would you want to live a life separated from God when He lives to serve you? I want to give you an opportunity while I'm praying in a few minutes to, to get into a relationship with God. Perhaps it's for the first time. Perhaps it's for the 15th time. To enter into a relationship with God. In, in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, the writer to the church in Corinth named Paul said this under the inspiration of God. We implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. Live under Jesus Christ. Be like Jesus Christ. That your service to others. And ask those three questions every day. Who can I serve? How can I serve? And who can I serve? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ, and this privilege to be called His followers. Father, I thank you so much for everyone you have brought here this morning. We pray that there's huge encouragement in our hearts and in our lives, and particularly in the areas of this message of, of becoming a servant of others, of looking after others. What an incredible town our town will become as we serve and, and mix amongst the community even more than what we're doing now. Thank you for those that are in this church that are already serving in the community too, Father, and in this church community. We thank you for our kids and our construction teachers and our uh, worship leaders and musicians and uh, all the kitchen people and the welcomers and just the people who actually come and just smile to you, Father. Thank you so much for that. Father, I know that there's people in this building who don't yet have a relationship with you that have never asked Jesus Christ to forgive their sins, so I'm just going to take a moment now for you. But if you are in this room, or, or in this building, sorry, I'm just going to why don't you turn your heart to God now? Why don't you turn your heart to Jesus and ask Him to forgive your sins for everything you've ever done wrong so that you can enter into a relationship that you've done for the first time? If so, whilst Margie, who did the notices this morning on myself, I'd love to pray with you after church or just talk it through with you and help you with that. Just please come and see us. We'd love you. But Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for those who are yet to know you. Who are living in estranged from you, Father. Would you draw them back in through your willing of the Holy Spirit? Would you draw them back in through the kindness of your church? We want to know you more and serve you more. Thank you so much for this privilege and opportunity to be here in your own way. So much uh, as we launched back into our series with Mark last week, we're going to carry on with Mark. I encourage you to keep reading from chapter 10 onwards. Um, keep just letting it soak in. Keep thinking about those three questions as you wake up in the morning. But right now, there's a cup of tea, coffee, cold drinks next door, standing out in the front of the shade. We'd just love to catch up with you. Bless you all. Have a great week.